All right, so first, this is set uh, for a value. I have two variables going on in here. I've got or three variables. I got a variable for A, N, and theta. And so I'm going to run it and then explain what each of those variables does. So this is the N leaf rows, chapter five. Turn it on. I'm going to move that uh, slider for N out of the way. And is set to four right now. I'm going to choose redraw. And it's going to draw a rose. And N is a slider for the variable. So we could set N to something else if we wanted to. Like, hopefully, you played around. Like, I could try setting it to three on the slider and then select redraw. So just something to notice when I made the four leaf rows, it actually made eight leaves. And when I made the three leaf rows, it made three leaves. So it behaves different depending on whether it got a three or a four. So maybe I'll back it down to two and see what happens. For two, it's giving me four leaves, interesting. So two, it gave four leaves. Three, it gave three leaves. Four, it gave eight leaves. Anyone want to guess what five is going to do? It's going to be five leaves and six. Twelve, it's going to double. So it looks like odd numbers, it does that many leaves. Even numbers, it does twice as many leaves. Okay, that was a mathematical reason for that. I'm not going to get into it here. Um, what we have going on here, though, is in terms of uh, the rows, uh, function, the rows procedure here, is we have this variable called theta. Theta is a Greek letter, and in math, we use it for an angle often. So basically, I'm saying for this drawing, set the angle to zero, and then I'm going to repeat 360 times. And at the end of the repeat, notice it ups theta by one. So I'm basically taking that angle, the angle is called theta, and we're looping that angle from zero to 360. Okay. Now, what we're doing in there is we're pointing in the direction theta, whatever theta happens to be, and then we're just saying move according to this mathematical procedure right here. And the mathematical procedure, let's blow that up a little bit, just says take this number A, which over here was set to 100, and then multiply it by this thing called COS of the value N that we gave it times the angle. Now, you don't need to know the details of that. If you took some trigonometry, you might have seen that before. But it's that move command right there that's making this happen the way it's happening there. Now, what I want to do with this is I want to adjust the procedure to take a new value for A and a new value for N in the procedure, right? So I want to add variables, those variables A and N to the procedure. Um, and I also want A to be a slider too, so we can mess around and see what A does, okay? Because right now when I zoom out or move over here, it's just setting A to 100. Now we could just change that 100 to something else, but it'd be kind of fun to have a slider for it too, right? So let's, let's make A a slider. And so if we just click on the uh, checkbox by the variable A, that'll put A up there. And then I'm just gonna move it away from the redraw button. If I right click on that, variable display box, then I get some options here, one of which is called slider. So now A is a slider. But there's a problem though with the slider and my code. What does my code say to do with A? Set A to 100, yeah. So it doesn't matter what I do with the slider with that set A to 100 there. So if I wanna actually use the slider, I gotta pop out that set A to 100 and then put the rows back in there. And I'm just doing that with you right away because in the past I've had students say, I can't get in to slide, it won't slide. And it's just, you gotta pull that out there because we're gonna use the slider up there to set uh, A. All right, next we wanna redefine the rows to add some parameters to deal with A and N. So we're going to edit that block and we're gonna add an input. Oh, let's click the button, there we go. And let's see. Um, I'm going to call this a number. 
So that's my A. And then I'm going to add another one. I'm going to call this N number. Just to differentiate them from the A and the N that are already defined. Could I have them be the same thing? Yes. Scratch can usually deal with that. Oh, speaking of having things named similar, Morgan, did you get my response to that problem we had the other day? Yeah. Okay. Did it make sense? Yeah, that's what I thought the problem was doing, but I didn't know how to fix it. Yeah, okay. So we're good now there. All right. So I'm going to have A number. I'm going to have N number. I'm going to choose okay. So now I have the procedure uh, that's expecting to get A number and N number. And remember, those are parameters. Parameters have to be used in that block. So wherever I have A, I'm going to replace it with a number, just one spot. Get rid of that for now. And then whenever I have n, I want to put in the parameter version of n, the number. And that's going to pop that n out. I'm just going to get rid of that for now. And now when I call rows, I got to tell it what to do. So up here, they're called parameters. When I actually use the rows procedure, now they're, they're um, arguments for that procedure. So from variables, we're just gonna pop the A into the first spot because that's where it's expecting it to be and the N into the second spot. So now we've just redefined our procedure to have parameters, which are variables that live within the procedure. And then when we call up to use row, when we, when we have that receive redraw uh, broadcast message, we're then telling rows to get whatever's on the sliders for A and N. So we're using the sliders to get input. That input gets fed into rows. In define rows here, again, it's saying, all right, whatever a number is, we're gonna have that in the front of the move command that's gonna be multiplied by this other stuff. And that happens to have that number N inside of it. So let's run it and see if it works. So right now I have n equals two, a equals 100, which was like the last one I did. And it should just draw that same four leaf rows we had earlier. And we should be able to adjust to see what a does now. So I'm just gonna change A, I'm just gonna use that slider, drag it down, and I go to that 46 there, I'm just gonna redraw and see what happens. So notice I got a smaller row. So this is a lot like that house we drew before that had the scale variable in it. The A is a scaling factor for how big the rose is gonna be. It's kind of like a diameter of a circle that the rose lives inside of. Or it's actually the radius. So you can play around with uh, A, the scale, and N, which is related to the number of petals, but not exactly the number of petals, right? So if we picked N to be five, two gave us four petals, but five we predicted after a few tries should give us just five petals. And here mine are gonna be smaller because I set that radius to be 46 instead of 100. Anybody had any trouble Getting that to be set up, let me know. Compare your code to my code, see what happens. And then this again is what I was hoping for that last part of the practice uh, assignment for this week. Questions? Anybody interested in extra credit? Maybe, okay. So I'm gonna write down the extra credit and, and uh, I'm gonna not do it. I'm gonna let you try to do it. And it's just a minor tweak to what we did here. Whiteboard. And I'll send a message out to this and I'll add it to the uh, assignment. Okay, so right now that N rows that we're drawing basically is being drawn with the move command where we move according to A, whatever that is, times this thing called COS. And inside COS, we take N times theta. Now, right now, we're just letting N be numbers like two and three and four and five and so on. 
something more interesting happens if n is a fraction. Come on, Pam, there you go. Like maybe I'll call the fraction n divided by m. So if you put a fraction in place of m, something interesting happens. n does something similar to what it did before, but and, and then n adds a new twist to it. So extra credit, if you can add another variable for m, the denominator of a fraction, to multiply by the angle theta, and then make a note to me about how does this change the rows. So two parts. One would be to add that variable in as a fraction multiplied in there. So add this in. That's part one of the extra credit. Part two of the extra credit is uh, if you can describe to me what you think M is doing to the graph. Okay. So kind of like, remember we, we did that, what was it? Uh, nine times nine and 99 times 99. There was a pattern to the product of that. There's kind of a pattern that develops here. Like there's a pattern for N. We discovered that if N was an odd number, we get just that odd number of leaves. If N was an even number, we got twice as many leaves, right? So there's another pattern that happens with you make a fraction in there. So describe that to me. So describe what M does to the graph, to the graph. And the bigger one I'm concerned about here is, is getting that variable in there using the division properly in scratch. Um, so that's the big extra credit and a little bit more if you can see the pattern. That's not as big a deal to me because this is about programming mostly, but programming does involve noticing patterns and using them. All right, so uh, after class, I'll add that extra credit into the assignment and I'll email the rest of the class, make sure everybody's aware of it. Optional, you don't have to do it, but a little more practice and programming is a good thing. All right, um, were there any questions on, let's see, we pretty much did the rest of that assignment last class. You should at this point, if you were following along, be done with the reading assignment. Let's take a look at the uh, problems for this week. So you're gonna have a Google Doc like last week. This one's gonna be called chapter five homework. And in there, you're going to have a, a bulleted list that links out to the shared version of each of your uh, problems. So numbers five, six, nine, and 11. And then you're just gonna tell me, put a little note underneath each one in the bullet. Okay, um, I'll make a couple notes about, I think they're mostly not that hard. The whack-a-mole, the last one's probably the hardest. So I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But problem number six, most people did something like that in week one when we did the Fahrenheit to Celsius. And then uh, problem number nine is pretty straightforward. And I've, some people have impressed me with their mad libs for number five in the past. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's see, I missed the chat here. What does it say? Ah, oh, welcome you guys, good to, good to have you. Okay, so next I want to show you some uses of variables to deal with gravity. So if you could, on the home page for the course, we have the announcements at the top, and I've mentioned I was going to use those announcements to share some things with you that we can look at in class. So the week five sharing, last class, I put in my draw a right or isosceles triangle, which used a, a procedure and a condition, the if statement to decide what to do. And we'll do more uh, in an upcoming chapter about working with those if statements. And then I just added move with arrows and gravity, and the COVID game continued where I wanna describe how I'm gonna extend that little COVID game I started a couple of weeks ago and, and evolve it more for my final project and how many variables to do that. So let's first take a look at move with arrows and gravity. So I'd highly recommend uh, opening that up yourself. It should take you to my project for this. 
And it's not a bad idea if you do something interesting that you're sharing to add something about it there. So here I just say, use the up arrow to give a scratch, the scratch cat a boost. Gravity will then pull him down and then use the left and right arrows uh, to move left and right. And I added a little slide in there. And so I wanna show you how I use variables to make the slide. So first I'm just gonna run it here. He does a little jump to start, blow it up so we can see it better that out of the way so it's, it's already started it so if i go with the left and right arrows he i didn't go anywhere then hit start there we go if i hold the arrow and let go he moves a little after i let go right so it's a little slide he's got some momentum because we don't when we run do we stop instantly yeah if we hit something or if we're not going too fast but if you're going fast, you don't stop instantly, you slow down, right? So I was trying to get that kind of effect in here. Uh, and I haven't changed costume when I'm, or, or changed direction when I'm doing that. So I let go of the arrow and he slides a little bit. Okay, so if you get a chance, go try that yourself, see the slide happen. Uh, when I push the up arrow, he gets a little boost. And then gravity pulls him down. And I got to fix that a little bit. He slips into the ground a little bit, depending on how high he goes. And what I tried to do here is take into consideration, it's not really good gravity. A little good gravity is a little more complicated, but uh, he, he, he is being pulled down based on how high he is. And so he's going to pick up speed as he comes down. So you should notice if he goes up a little bit, he doesn't fall too fast, but if he goes up higher, he starts to fall faster. Okay, so let's take a look at how I did that. So let's get out of there. And again, you can either watch my screen or look at it yourself. And I'm just going to talk through it. So I'm going to go see inside. Okay, so uh, I've got the, he, he switches costume when I start and I put him in a certain place on the screen to start off with. Um, and then I've got gravity when not near the bottom of the stage. And to do that, I've got a forever loop, always looking to see what his position is vertically. So I'm in this first block right here, Let's stop it. And then in there, if he happens to be touching that color brown, which is that brown color on my backdrop there, then if he's touching it, I'm gonna set V, Y. So V, so I, I mentioned naming variables. Sometimes when we name variables, we like to be very descriptive and a lot of people like to make short variable names that they just get. So uh, when I wrote this, for some reason, I don't know, I think I was teaching a calculus class. I wanted a short variable name. So the V stands for velocity, which is speed, change in position, and the Y stands for Y. So I'm just with that variable reminding myself that this is changing the speed of, of the Y position. So how fast Y is, is shifting. And here I'm saying, don't change Y. Set it, set the change in, in, in height to zero. And then otherwise, I'm always changing Y by negative one, the, the velocity by negative one. And I'm looping that by uh, changing the actual Y value by whatever that says. So as this loop is running, at first, um, y velocity is zero. And the first time through this loop, if he's not touching the ground, it sets the, the y velocity to negative one. And if he's still not touching the ground, it sets it to negative two. And if he's still not touching the ground, he sets it, we set it to negative three and then negative four. So that's just this yellow, this line right here, the R, just the orange one. And at the same time or immediately after, I'm taking whatever yv happens to be at that time. And I'm also changing y by that. Right, so I just want to make a table. Sometimes when, when we're doing changing numbers like this, it's good to draw a table out to see what's happening. And I'm just going to do it on my notebook instead of a spreadsheet. And let me fix my pen here. That should work better. So the things I'm keeping track of are the Y value and the, the, the Y velocity, which essentially is a change in the Y value. 
And initially the change is zero for the y velocity. We're not changing y at all. If that sprite isn't touching the brown at the bottom, then his y value is somewhere above it. So let's say his y value is something like um, 50. Then the first time through the loop, it sees he's not touching the stage and it's gonna set y velocity to negative one. And it's also gonna apply that to the y and right away, I think I need another column for new y. I'll just do this arrow. Right away, it's gonna drop that down to 49. Now, once it does those two things, it runs through the loop again. It sees he's not touching the stage and it's gonna drop the y velocity by one again. And now the, the change in y is gonna be negative two. And it's gonna immediately take that away from whatever y is, drop it to 48. And it runs through the loop again. And it says, is he touching the ground? Well, at 48 y, he's still not touching the ground. So what's it gonna do with the y velocity? It's gonna drop it by one again to negative three. It's gonna immediately adjust the y with that negative three. And it's going to give me, let's see, I can't subtract, can I? What's 49 minus 2? 47, thank you. Yeah, if I make a mistake in my arithmetic, please yell at me or just kindly say, hey, that's not right. All right that should be 47. And then we take 3 away from that. So now we're down to 44. And just, I'm not going to do the whole sequence here. I'm just going to do a few steps to, to show what's happening. The, the cat is on the ground right now. And his y position is negative 158. So 50 is somewhere up here, around there. And down here is negative 158, right? And when I make him move, right, he's moving pretty fast. So let's get him up to about 50. Uh, that's probably about 50 there. Oh, I forgot to start the game. Let's start the game. And, and gra as soon as I start the game, gravity kicks in. Boom. He fell down. Looked like he did a little bounce. Uh, I probably should take that go-to statement out. I think that's causing the bounce. Uh, but if he's not touching the ground, it's just going to keep doing that. So when he's up here, it's going to keep changing y and yv, which helps change y. So let's leave them there, go back to the notes here. And it's just doing it super fast. I mentioned before, those forever loops are running like 100 times a second, probably more than that. So 44 still isn't down at negative 158 where the ground lives. So it's going to change this again. This time it's going to change drop. It, every time it runs through the loop, it drops YV by one. And then it immediately applies that to Y. So now I'm at 40. And so can you see this, this change in Y is basically his speed at any particular point in that loop. Because speed changes position, right? If you're moving at five miles per hour, every fraction of an hour, you, you, you're somewhere else. Okay. What's happening to his speed here if we, if we ignore the sign? The negative just means go down. What's happening to the speed here if we don't worry about the negatives? The speed is doing what? It's getting bigger, right? It's increasing. And that's what gravity does to us. If we're falling, our speed increases. If that wasn't true, then it wouldn't matter whether I jumped off a chair or whether I jumped off a tall building. I'd have the same falling speed if gravity wasn't making my speed increase. But we all know if you jump from a high place, it's going to hurt really bad. Okay, But if you jump off a short thing, it's not going to be that bad. So, so, so this is a, 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 a relatively simple attempt at using gravity. This isn't exactly how gravity works. Gravity works a little bit different than this. Uh, it works a little faster. Um, is that true? slower at first and faster later. Yeah. Here I'm changing gravity in a straight line kind of manner. Gravity doesn't change speed in a, a position in a straight line. So, but that's okay. It's close enough for this. Um, but you get what's happening here? The speed is dropping and the higher the cat is, the more it's going to keep pulling him down faster and faster and faster until he hits the ground. And this loop runs so fast, it's just plowing through those numbers really, really fast. So I could put it on a spreadsheet and see how many iterations of that for loop would have to run until it gets down to um, negative 158, which is where the, grab, the ground is. It's a lot of times through the loop. Not a huge number, but a fair amount. All right, so let me blow this up. 
So, so that's this part here, pulling it down. Now, when the up arrow is pressed, that's when I give him that little jet propulsion costume. And then I just, I make sure he's still pointing in the right direction. And I just uh, set his Y velocity to nine. I go and change Y by that amount. So every time space is pressed, he gets a nine pixel boost upward. If I hold, the up arrow down, then as fast as Scratch can recognize the up arrow is down, he's getting pushed upward, nine, 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 nine. That's all that's happening there, right? And there's lots of ways to implement that. I get a little one point one second pause in there um, so that he wasn't instantly. What's that? Where is this file? Yeah. yeah, so this file, if you missed it, is in the announcements, the week five sharing. It's the move with arrows and gravity. I just looked it up. Okay. Yeah, so anytime I, I use something like this that I want you guys to have, so, and you can reuse, if you say, oh, I think I could use this code. Do you remember how to reuse my code? Or someone else's code? Backpack. So that way you can get that same code into your script without having to retype it. Okay, so if I wanted my little COVID app to use this gravity thing, then I would just do this. If I liked this part right here, I would open up my backpack here and I would just grab this block and stick it in my backpack. And so here it is in my backpack. And then when, if I go in, like maybe I want the end leaf rose to use it. So then I could just grab that code by in the backpack and pull it out. Let's see, which one is it? Uh, I think it's actually this one. I could then pull it out and stick it in here. And there's the gravity in the end leaf rose. Okay, so the backpack is useful for grabbing chunks of code that are in one project to transfer them, give you a place to transfer into another one. I don't really want that there. Uh, it's not gonna do anything in there. Oh, what would that do in there? I don't know what's gonna happen there. Let's find out. <laughs> I don't wanna do that right now, <laughs> maybe later. All right, so, um, so that's, that's my simple impl implementation of gravity. If you go to the Scratch Wiki and you look up how to use, how to change with gravity, people have a ton of different ways to do it in there. And some of them are really cool. Some of them are way more complicated than this one right here. But my, I had two points with this. One, I needed a variable to help Y change for that sprite. And, um, Two, let's see, what was the other thing? I forgot what my other point was, let's move on. All right, so let's look at how I use the sliding left and right. So let's, if I run this, the cat's gonna drop. And if I, if I hold down the right key after, or the left key, after I let go of the key, he slides a little more, kind of like he's on ice. So it's not like, like you know, running, uh, in the grass and, and slowing to a stop or sliding in the dirt, like if you're a baseball player going to a base, um, but it's kind of similar and you could play with it. So this one here, so let's just take a look at the, uh, I don't want all of that out of there. Let's grab this one out for a minute. Yeah, so I'm just gonna pull the left arrow to see what's going on there. Pull that off for a sec. Off for a sec. All right, so just what's going on in the left arrow key, if it's pressed, it changes his costume. Um, and then I make sure he's pointing in the direction I want him to a point for that costume. And then all I do is I just change the VX. So V is like velocity, right? And that's speed. So I'm changing his X speed by negative seven. When I press the, let's see, right, left arrow key. So what, what that's going to do is just, um, just you know, change his movement just a little bit on the left arrow. And then when it's not pressed, it's going to change uh, that velocity to whatever the velocity was, but times 0.9. Okay. So the negative 0.7 just says, push him in the direction of negative seven, because that's the left, negative 0.7, that's the left arrow, left arrow goes left, left is a negative direction. And then the sliding basically says, 
Uh, once you let go of the key, whatever his speed was, take 90% of that, keep 90% of that, and keep looping through that, right? So it's just going to decrease. So let's say his speed was 10. If I take 90% of 10, I get 9. If I take 90% of 9, I get about 8.1. If I take 90% of 8.1, I get 7.2. So it's just going to whittle him down till Scratch can't compute anymore, and he has no more uh, X change there. So instead of doing it with a subtraction, I made it a gradual slide by doing a multiplication by a number less than one. Right. And there's some people that do gravity with kind of a multiplication thing like that too. But I chose to do the gravity with a subtraction and I chose to do the slide with a multiplication by a fraction that's less than one. Right. So, Variable names is brought up in the book and how to name things better. So when I look at this, I totally get the VX and VY because that's part of my background as a math teacher. Do most other people get that? Like, are some of you still like, why did he call it VX again? Why did he call it VY? If you look at it tomorrow, will you wonder why I called it VX and VY? Maybe if you haven't seen that before. So what would have been a better name for say VX? I could just call it slide or slide factor. I could call it, it's really his speed. It's his change in X. So I could call it X speed might've been another name. And instead of the VY, a better name might've been Y speed, okay? A lot of times when I'm doing these things, a name for a variable comes into my head and it's like, oh yeah, that's a good name. And then tomorrow I'm like, that was a stupid name. Why'd you call it that? Let's call it this instead, okay? Now, the problem with that is if you used it a whole bunch of times in your code, you gotta go find everywhere it lives in the code and change it. Modern code editors make that easier, but it's still an issue. So you should put some thought in your variable names, give them good names at the, at the start. Sprites come with a name called a variable called my variable. Always, if you use it, rename it. Don't leave it my variable. Call it something related to what it does. Okay. So always choose good names for your variables. All right. So that's there for you guys to look at. You can make a copy of it. You can pick it apart, change things and see what happens. You can reuse parts of it if you want to. And like I mentioned, if you go to the Scratch Wiki and you, and you search for like sliding or gravity, you'll find a ton of different ways people have done that kind of thing. So this is just one way to do each of those. All right. Let's see. What do I want to do next? Um, let's take a look at my COVID game. I just want to talk about that. I want to make sure you're thinking about a final project because we are halfway through the term. We only have a few more chapters to do in the book. And then the last couple of weeks are going to be just working on the final project. But you really should start playing around with ideas now. So check out my COVID game here. And I'm just going to make some notes about what I want to do. So that's my original instructions are just like they were before. Dr. P is fighting off wild COVID viruses. Uh, he can move with the arrow keys. That uses that arrow key movement we went over way back in week two with the forever loops. Um, and then uh, I can use, uh, he's got a force shield that I can press S and I can use the space bar to, to launch a vaccine. And that is he just draws a little red um, polygon and uh, so I'm just going to run what I got right now. COVID's run around. If one touches him, he tries to eat it. If it happens to go into his mouth, he kills it. And quacks. And if the COVID happens to go in there, oh, I should launch something like put up the force shield. Okay, this force shield's up. And if they hit the force shield, oops, that one missed, they're going to die because I have it set to when they hit red, they die. And I keep missing. Let's launch a sports shield. Launch, launch. Oh, let's move them around. Get, get back here. All right. So, so I haven't really changed much there. Um, I did do. Uh, a, a notice his COVID strength is negative something right now. All right. So, a lot of times in games, let's stop that. You want to keep track of points, but in a lot of games, also you, your character can dock, right? So, so I put the strength variable in there for that, uh, and and I got a couple ideas on what I want to do with that. So, two ideas that I'm going to try and implement here, and I've got them started, and you can help me do a little bit more. 
So my COVID project, COVID game project, uh, I want to add in, which I started but didn't finish, uh, Dr. P's strength. So that if he gets hit by too many COVIDs without killing them, then he's going to actually die. So add in Dr. P strength. So he might die, lose the game. Uh, I also um, do viruses die easy? And the answer is no, they don't. So I'm also going to give the viruses some strength so he can't instantly kill them. He's got to like hit them a couple of times to get rid of them. So I'm also going to add some COVID strength. And then I also want to add some kind of point system. And so I'm going to need variables for that. And I started putting these in there. Let's look inside. All right, so let's see. So I'm on Dr. P right now, and I'm going to head over to his variables. And he has access to the COVID strength. I'm going to turn that off for now. He has access to what I'm calling cured count. So I'm thinking if you get rid of a virus, then you maybe cured something. I got to come up with a name for it. And maybe that's not the best one. I thought about calling it COVID counts. Maybe we could call it confirmed kills, but that sounded kind of creepy. So anyway, choosing variable names sometimes is hard. Uh, he has access to his strength. So COVID strength. Um, cured count and uh, doc, uh, doctor strength we got there. And then the COVIDs have access to the variables COVID strength and cured count. So cured count is what I was thinking of were the viruses that he eliminated. So it's not a bad idea if you have a complicated game to make some notes about your variables. And you can do that on paper in a document. You can add comments to your code. Usually we add comments. So let's see, point system. That's what I was thinking the cured count would be. And the COVID strength and the Dr. P strength, I think are pretty straightforward. And then the question is, what variables should all the sprites be able to change? And what variable should only one sprite or the other sprite be able to change? So what, if we look at the variables I have, there's two variables here, let's blow this up. This is how we zoom in on the screen, there we go. Blow that down. So the uh, COVID guy has access to COVID strength and cured count. And Dr. P also has access to COVID strength and cured count. So those are what we call global variables, right? All the sprites have access to them. Dr. P, his strength didn't show up with the COVIDs, so only he can change that variable. Now the COVIDs can still see that variable, but they can't change it. They can't change it. So I could do something like um, if Dr. P's strength is low, like let's say 10 is low, then maybe the COVIDs might reproduce more like, oh, we're going to get them, we're going to get them, we're going to get them. Okay. So they could react to his strength, but they can't change it directly. All right. So you always got to decide, how do you want your variables to be affected? Um, other thing you have to be careful of, if a variable is global, who gets to change it when? And sometimes it can be a problem if you have multiple sprites changing the same variable when the same thing has happened. Like for, let's think about the, um, the cured count. Right now, the cured count is accessible by both the COVIDs and Dr. P. So if Dr. P says, I get a point, I get a cured count when one of those guys dies, if that's in his code, would I also put that code in here for the COVID? If a COVID no, dies, right? Because I have uh, I had a line in here. Where is it? Over here. The clone's going to get deleted when its strength is is down to zero. Should I also give Doctor P a point then too? 
right? That would be a problem if they're both giving points for the same thing. So you want to be careful about when a point happens, when some number changes, who gets to change it? And sometimes it could be one way or another way and you just pick one. Other times the code's going to require you to only have it happen one way. All right, so that's always a big choice. All right, um, let's see. That's about all I have for you there. I'm gonna keep editing this and I'll show it to you as I edit it. Um, questions, concerns? Oh, I wanted to talk about the whack-a-mole before I let you guys off. So again, stuff I share will be in the announcements. And then back to the aside problems. Uh, oops, wrong chapter. Uh, and the broken game. So the broken game, so definitely play that game. And it's a really easy fix. You only have to make one minor adjustment to the game. And it's about one of the big ideas uh, that I was just going over, who gets to control what variable. Okay? And that can make or break a game, that idea of scope. Okay? So check that out. I think that's all I need to say about that. The whack-a-mole, let's open that up. So if you haven't already looked at it, let's take a look now. It's in the chapter scripts under chapter five, whack-a-mole. All right, so right now, if we just run it, the cat's going to jump around the screen randomly. And your job is to hit the cat. And so you could do that with the mouse by just trying to click on him when you see him before he goes away. Oh. Now nothing's happening right now. So what should happen is if you hit the cat, then you should get a hit. And if you miss the cat, then that should register as a miss. Okay. So one way to make that happen is you have some code in the cat that says when he's hit by the mouse, he, a point uh, appears in the hits. And then the stage is actually, um, the backdrop is, is the whack-a-mole game. And so if you miss the cat and hit the stage instead, that should register as a miss. Okay. Now the variables hits and misses are already in there and they're being displayed uh, on the screen here. So you, what you have to do again is you have to use those variables in the right place. So in the script area for the stage or the script area for the cat. And then uh, you have to end the game. So you have to make some kind of decision to end the game. I would like you to include some sound effects in here, some music in here, if possible. And then um, I thought it would be fun instead of just using the mouse, like if you had a hammer, to hit the cat with, like in a whack-a-mole. You ever play whack-a-mole in a video game place when you were a kid, yeah. right? Um, you could have some other sprite that does the hitting instead, okay? So that could be an option too, if you wanted to play around with that. Um, yeah, so again, you gotta make sure the right entity, the cat or the stage keeps track of hits and misses. Um, you want some sound effects to go on in here. You have to decide when the game is over and then something should happen on the screen to indicate game over. Okay, so you're gonna make those changes happen. Uh, it's not too bad. And if you want to add another sprite that whacks the cat, that would be cool too. Otherwise it's just your mouse pointer. That's the whacker click, okay. All right, so you guys have stuff to do. So I'm just gonna hang out and answer any questions that you have. So use this time to uh, get your work done.